if we were doing this in person, I could have just pulled up. Um, but I have really been enjoying your state and I am super excited to be talking with you guys today. Um, so one of the very first things that I like to lead with when I talk about the victory that, chill out Congress, sorry, that we have had here in Georgia is that it was a long time coming. Um, the organizing for us to flip the state really began in 1992 um, when we, <clears throat> excuse me, lost our governorship uh, and had our first Republican governor, um, at least in my lifetime, right? Uh, not our very first one, let me be clear. Um, so that was when the state flipped red and efforts to uh, flip the state back blue have been happening ever since. Uh, so one that's that's probably the most important thing because I think when I talk to people, especially across the country, they overwhelmingly feel like this all of a sudden just happened overnight. And the reality is we have been fighting things like gerrymandering, which we're in a fight against right now, I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, voter suppression tactics, bullying of board of election offices uh, by way of state legislation, kind of like some of the things that we saw here when SB 202 passed, which I'll also talk about in a little bit. Um, but the efforts to register and mobilize uh, specifically to our state, black and brown voters is a long, long experience um, that is the true definition, right, of grassroots organizing. Uh, so the first pioneers that did this are people like Deborah Scott, Helen Butler, um, and Stacey Abrams and my CEO, Nse Ufat, came along a little bit later, actually. Uh, but these groups started registering Black and Brown people because even then we understood that the majority of our state's population would no longer be made up of the status quo that often vote conservatively, um, which is white men. Uh, so by the year 2024, that is <clears throat> our excuse me, that's how we actually got our name, right? The new Georgia project, because we know that in 2024, the majority population is going to be made up of people that look more like me, black, brown, young people um, under the age of 40. So in an effort to work to make sure that the populous majority, the, the majority of people here was also represented. That's how my organization came along. So uh, prior to Stacey Abrams running for governor, she was actually a state legislator uh, for several years here in the state house. And um, in her work there, when she left the, left the state house, that's when she and my CEO in say Ufat founded the New Georgia Project. Um, so we have registered some over 800,000 people to vote in the last six years. Um, last year was actually an off year for us uh, due to the pandemic. It really took a lot of work to re-strategize and figure out how we can register and mobilize people in the midst of a pandemic. But our game has always been very, very simple. We go where the people are. We do not operate with this expectation or this assumption, uh, right, that we know better. Georgia is a very interesting state. In fact, if it was divided by culture, uh, it could be a couple of different states, at least two, if not three. So when we go into different parts of the state and we leave places like Atlanta that are a major metropolis and have uh, more money, that have more access, more resources, our strategy is very, very different. And it always begins with what we call a deep canvas. Uh, so when we do that deep canvas, that's when we're going into the community to just ask people, what is it that you feel about the safety in your, excuse me, in your community? How do you feel about uh, access to reproductive health care, access to any health care? Um, do you feel like your board of education, right, is representative and is doing a good job and is utilizing the resources that they have in the best way? Do you feel like you have enough resources, right? So really talking to people and asking them, what are the things that you care about? 
because that is how you will find what mobilizes people organically to vote. Most people have at least one thing that they care about enough to mobilize them, but you're never going to find out if you think it's what your thing is, right? Um, specifically, when I first started at the organization, I was the reproductive justice organizer. So reproductive justice has a lot to do with abortion access, but not only. Um, it actually has three other pillars, the right to have a child, the right to safe community, and the right to bodily autonomy. So in that campaign specifically, there were parts of the state where when we did our deep canvas, we didn't even talk about abortion, right? We just asked people, what are the things happening in your community? And in some parts of the state, it was feeling afraid of the police was more of an issue that they had than abortion access, right? Um, versus other places. So just using that as an example to kind of demonstrate how you can think that something is going to be what people most care about or the specific demogra demographic, excuse me, really, really cares about. And then you find out uh, that in fact, it's this completely other thing and that's where you put your resources. Right, that's where you put your, excuse me, uh, time and effort and money. Um, one of the things that we work really, really hard at is to also just make sure that we know what uh, policies are working against us in specific communities. So there's state legislation. And then when you go into certain places, there are specific problems that they have within that county or that city, right? So by working with people to understand like, hey, in this place, we actually only have two or three voting precincts. We know that that's a place that perhaps we want to do more absentee uh, absentee mailing uh, campaigning or suggestions. Um, we want to door knock and register people, but also give them the opportunity in Georgia at least it's different in every state, right? But in Georgia, you're able to apply for your absentee ballot at the same time as you register. So when we're working with some populations that we know have less access to voting precincts or to ballot drop boxes uh, or early voting locations, or the hours are shorter just because that's what the Board of Elections in that county can afford to do, we will work in that county or in that population to make sure that other voting techniques are even more accessible. Um, these are the places where we're going to invest more money in our ride to the polls, right? So we invest that kind of money in places like Atlanta, but we invest the same, if not more sometimes in smaller, but also well-populated places like an Albany, Georgia or a Columbus, Georgia, which are not super small towns, but have different challenges and access than perhaps in Atlanta does. So again, utilizing very similar strategies across the state, but really curtailing it to exactly who we're talking about. We're also talking about doing a lot of research on the front end. So who are the people in this community that vote? Who are the people that don't? some communities will surprise you, right? So again, making sure that you're not leading with the assumption that we have to talk to black people in general to get this, uh, to turn the vote out. Maybe we specifically need to talk to black men 18 to 40, because we know that uh, black men over this age turn out, black women turn out at record rates on a normal basis. So as opposed to speaking in one language, right, and assuming we have the opportunity via research, via uh, data turnout, or turnout, excuse me, um, yikes, sorry, <laughs> turnout <laughs> data, that lets us know uh, exactly who we can expect to turn out. So then once we have identified who's not voting, the deep canvas that I mentioned, that's where we're really going to start that because we want to understand what's the thing that moves these people via the deep canvas that I just that I described earlier. That's how we're going to be able to do that. So fast forward to 2020. Um, the things that I described are things that have been happening for the last 28 years, right? The deep canvassing, the door knocking, the driving people to the polls, the absentee ballot campaigns. Those are things that we have continuously done. Um, 
in 2020, we really, really had to make a lot of adjustments, uh, adjustments that are carrying over in 2021 as well. Um, we were not able to knock on doors in the same way before. And if we did knock on doors, we had to have uh, the PPE, right? We had to have some kind of COVID protocol in place that would keep us safe. So our staff, um, we have been getting tested every single week since COVID started. Uh, in March, we, we reached back into the field in May. So every week um, we have been able to excuse me, have testing state at all of our statewide offices. Um, we have been able to not have outbreaks in offices, right, because of this. We have had, uh, I think, two people that tested for COVID um, in that entire time span, which we were very lucky, right, that it was only two because in each case it was isolated. And a lot of that did have to do with the safety precautions that we took, making sure that if we were sending people out, we did not have them loaded up in the car, right? We didn't have four or five people in a car. At best it was two um, and really making sure that people kept safe. But what we understood is that we couldn't hit our goals relying only on the internet. Uh, it's interesting because we are doing some structural changes in our um, issue campaigns that we have. I can talk about that as well. Uh, but some of our organizers were really, really disappointed to lose their social media and their access to Instagram specifically. And what we had to explain to them was that organizing doesn't happen on the internet, right? The internet is a great place to amplify. It's a great place to hold spaces like this when we can't get together, but this is not where organizing happens. Uh, you have to be in community with people. So after about two months um, of working remotely, and just doing nothing but deep canvassing on the phone, we went back into community and started registering people to vote either via hotspots or our regular door knocking in communities where we see low voter turnout per percentage of people that are living there, right? Again, everything that we do being data driven. So we want to go to places to register people to vote where we can capture a lot of people that can sometimes be college campuses, that can be shopping areas. Um, in Atlanta, right, we have places like the World of Coke or the Aquarium, which does have a lot of tourists, but also has a lot of employees, right? Um, so catching those people and catching large amounts of people um, at the same time is always a really, really just obvious low hanging fruit way to register people to vote. Another thing, I'm not sure if you guys have this experience in Maryland, I certainly hope that you don't, but we also experience people being dropped from voter rolls. That's another group of low hanging fruit that we can re-register. So we're able to research people that used to be registered to vote and have not been registered to vote again. That allows us, that gives us a name, address, phone number to call someone to knock on the door and say, hey, I know that you were registered to vote. One, do you even know that you're not registered to vote anymore? Because the way it works in Georgia, they have rules, but accidents happen, right? <laughs> um, so there have been a lot of people who voted in the last election, and then all of a sudden found themselves no longer registered to vote due to inactivity, when really it's supposed to be over some course of a few years that you've been inactive in order for them to drop you. However, the first thing is just letting people know that that's happened. You would be surprised how many people just did not know. And unfortunately, a lot of times it's elderly people. Um, it's elderly people and it is young people. Um, so really trying to catch those people that they think may be less likely to notice or have less access to actually do something about it. Um, so registering people that have that interest, we do a lot of work with churches as well. Um, in communities that we serve, especially in black communities, there is a uh, serious connection with the church. The church is where we go for a lot of things, not just our spiritual uh, healing and feeding. Um, so churches are a great place to organize, college campuses, but specifically, going into like community colleges and vocational schools. 
the reason that those are even more impactful for how you spend your time, sorry for the dog. Um, the reason that those are more impactful for how you spend your time sometimes than your larger universities is because those people live nine times out of 10 where they go to school. Very unlikely that you have someone moving from California to go to the Queen City Community College, right? Um, it's more than likely going to be someone that is from Maryland or this is the DMV, right? We do have people that do implant, but still you're, you're more likely to capture actual local people if you go to local places. Um, the larger universities, sometimes people are willing to move their voter registration, sometimes they're not, and that's okay. Um, you don't have to force them into doing that. Excuse me. Um, I do want to make sure that I talk a little bit about the elephant in the room, uh, no pun intended, of SB 202 and the voter suppression that we are dealing with now. Um, so in short, if you haven't seen on the news, uh, Senate Bill 202 is a monster um, and essentially the culmination of 82 voter suppression laws that were offered up in our state house this year. Um, really unfortunate, makes places, makes counties choose between, or precincts rather choose between Saturday or Sunday voting. Um, they say that not a lot of people vote on Sunday. What we know is that 37% of black voters voted on Sunday in 2020 and do so and have historically. So that's a direct attack on trying to do that. They say they're expanding uh, voting when really we've cut it down from three weeks to one week of early voting excuse me, we have eliminated the places that can serve as drop boxes. Um, and we are also making all of this happen at the expense of the local board of elections. So it's a bill with no fiscal note estimated to cost some $50 million that's going to be implemented on counties that already can't afford the things that we're, that they are required to do as evidenced by this year when our organization was bringing extension cords to places because they didn't have enough power sources to connect the voting machines. So people were not able to vote on time, right? So, um, Unfortunately, this is the law now. It also makes it illegal for us to do the small things that we did, like take water and uh, snacks to people, umbrellas, ponchos. It makes that a felony. Um, so now it's illegal to help people stand in line, right? We know that we have long lines in Georgia. We know that they're going to be longer impacted by this kind of legislation and they're going to criminalize and penalize people for trying to work against them. At this point, we're hoping for a federal injunction. We're hoping that uh, House Bill 1 and House Bill 4 pass on the federal level because those protect us. And, um, and then this will be the last thing that I talk about before the Q&A, and they also, uh, create independent redistricting. That's super important, especially in a place like Georgia, please relax, especially in a place like Georgia, because uh, the same legislation, the same legislators, excuse me, that brought up House Bill 2, or excuse me, Senate Bill 202, passed it into law, um, are the same people who are going to draw the redistricting lines that will be in effect for the next 10 years. That is huge. Gerrymandering is a real, 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 real thing here in Georgia. If you look at some of the lines, they don't make sense. Um, they're skinny down here and they're really big up here and they, it, it, it's very obvious, right? So uh, we have the we will receive two more legislators as well. So this also impacts where those two people come from and what kind of equity we have in uh, the district lines that are drawn. So a lot of things still happening in Georgia, um, but the biggest thing is that we are still finding ways to register people to vote. We're still having mutual aid. Uh, we're having, uh, made for May Day, we're going to be doing like a workers appreciation day. Uh, one of the main things that we do when we register people to vote, I don't want to forget to do this or have events where we catch up with people that are already registered to vote. We always catch their email and their phone number, their phone number first, their email, and then whatever part of their address they're willing to share, 
but at the very, 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 very minimum, their zip code. We want to get it all, but sometimes people, as you know, are not willing to share it all. So the mandatory things are always going to be their phone number and their zip code. We try and get their email address and we try and get that full address, but we at the very least want to be able to call them, opt them into our text messaging systems, whatever those things are, so that when we get ready to come up to an election, we can call them and ask them if they need any help getting to the polls and also make sure that we're ready to do whatever uh, legal help they need to get there. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> very busy, very, uh, very effective. My goodness. Um, I'm just, um, I'm going to ask the first question. You talked about deep canvassing and starting with people, with the people who don't vote, right? Mm -hmm. So how, and then you also made a comment about, um, oh, something about, Oh, in 2024 in Georgia, the majority will be black or brown, mm -hmm. right? Well, where we live on Maryland's Eastern shore, I don't know if you're familiar with the geography, but we live on the Eastern side of the Bay and this part of Maryland, and there are other parts of Maryland too. Uh, we are very conservative and red. And we're very, as you can see from this group, we're very um, non, well, we're very white. I'm just going to say that. So, you know, it's um, it's really a it, it's a predicament here. I mean, we don't we, Democrats don't win elections over here. So, um, I don't know. I don't know where to start. Well, the first thing that I think about is, um, and I I don't want to sound crass when I'm saying this, right? But there are there's someone that's discriminated against in Maryland. Most often that's gonna be poor people. Poor people come in all types of shades, uh, demographic, sexuality, whatever may have you, right? So when we look at voter suppression, what we understand is that in a place like Georgia, it's against black and brown people, right? But there are other people that are more than likely having their votes suppressed, whether they know it or not, or voting against their best interest. So that's where that deep canvassing stuff really, really comes in handy. Once you've identified the people that don't vote that often but are registered or find those pockets of places that don't have a lot of registered people, more than likely they're gonna have a lower socioeconomic, uh, excuse me, uh, trait or, or palette, if you will, than the people that are super, super active to vote. And then having those conversations with them about why they don't vote, why they feel that their vote is ineffective, and also being realistic with them, right? Like, we know that it takes time to build power. It doesn't happen overnight. But if you know what impacts them, maybe it's that they don't have, maybe they have food deserts where they live, right? Maybe they want legislation that makes their uh, their meals healthier in the schools because they don't have access to affordable foods in their part of the world because they are lower income and understanding and then working around how to organize that with local electives, statewide electives and things like that. And then showing people, not telling them, but like really showing them that this is what can happen when we lean on our legislators, whether they're conservative or not, because hung people are hungry. And whether you're conservative or a Democrat, you might be open to talking to someone about how we can get some more groceries or access to healthy food in your neighborhood if that's your issue for example i hope that was helpful good thank you um anyone else just unmute yourself and ask the question well i have a question so i know you said you did this over 20 some years um and obviously having all these canvassers and um, what not cost money. So how did you raise the funds to do the work that you needed to do to flip Georgia? That's a great question. Um, I think that Georgia is, I think that people see the promise in Georgia, 
right? I think that we've been able to garner some of that national attention. But one of the first things that we do is just have a really uh, substantial volunteer base. When you have that kind of volunteer base, one thing that you can do is move into members or dues paying membership, right? Um, so having something that people can buy into, having a $50 a year experience where people can um, receive additional voting rights trainings or uh, voting defending trainings or something like that, right? That makes their dues membership different and raising money in those kind of ways. Um, and then also looking for grants that help to do the work that you're looking to do. So one of the ways that we raise money specifically at NGP, we have um, issue-based campaigns. So for example, the Susan Buffett Foundation, the wife of Warren Buffett, uh, they're investing a lot of money into reproductive justice. We have nine issue-based campaigns. One is for black men, one is for reproductive justice. There's seven others, but there are people and groups that will fund moving specific uh, voting bases. So that's, it does, of course, one of the things with grants is once you do that, you do have to do certain things, but that works out perfectly for our model of our organization because we have those issue-based campaigns where we don't take all money though, right? So if someone's like, hey, we need you to work with this group and we know that we don't have capacity for it at this time, we don't take that money, right? Like we don't, unfortunately, in this moment, have a campaign for LGBTQ. So we can't really raise the money for that, but we can for the other campaigns that we have. So creating those kind of niche groups that allow you to, in the RJ campaign, right, we raise money over moving people to vote around abortion access, um, or like I was mentioning, the other three pillars of RJ, but identifying those voters and tracking them to the polls and just telling people that like, hey, we will use your money to do that. And how are we gonna find those people? We'll do mutual aid things, we'll do food drives, we'll do this kind of stuff and just really kind of get creative. Um, and have, of course, in those grants and in that those fundings request, how it's all going to come back to voting and having a way to track that you actually move them. So I think member, uh, dues paying membership base is one way that you can do that. And then the second would be looking for those national funders that are funding voting rights via um, via whatever that specific vehicle is. Um, I was wondering if we're, it's very rural here and we've tried an, any number of things for um, voter registration, most of which feels like they fail. Um, they're not places that easily have a lot of people there or, and then of course we get a lot, we've tried door to door, we've tried being at stores. I didn't know whether you had any creative um, ideas. And the other thing is, I think a lot of people's first response to are you registered to voters is, oh, yes, I am. And, you know, so I, I just, I guess we're looking for some more creative ideas to sort of get some energy around voter sure. registration. Um, we love to do events. Uh, right, like we are, we're very clear that we're not event planners, but we love to do events. And one of the things, like I was saying in Georgia specifically, because we know that, excuse me, people are purged from voting rolls, giving people the opportunity to confirm that they're registered to vote. Right? Um, we like, we have, we're known for our swag. I'm wearing one of our shirts right now. Right? So, and there's a local uh, designer who starts say Atlanta influences everything that did this shirt for us. So we like to give stuff away. Um, obviously it's illegal to give things away for the opportunity to vote, but we can give it to them, ask to keep in touch with them, give them that opportunity to uh, confirm that they're registered to vote. We also, because we know who our demographic is, one of the events that was really, really cool that we did was with Fuel the Vote. Um, that was par in partnership with Michelle Obama's organization, When We All Vote. That's also another good place to consider looking for funds too, especially during election years. Um, but 
we partnered with them and did these things called Fuel the Vote. So we would have voter registration and or confirmation, a DJ and a food truck, or we'd have bags of food that people could take. We would open it up for registration before, but you didn't have to register, right? Because we're not trying to make people feel like they have to shame themselves or embarrass themselves to get what we have to offer, but really just making ourselves known as the people who are going to help out community. And we're also probably going to annoy you about a little bit of voting stuff while we're doing it, but we're giving you something that you need. One of the things that we're even doing now, because starting June 1st, the way that all of us across the country utilize text messaging, for example, is going to change. All of our individual campaigns um, this week are working on pulling a universe uh, for them to text for, to show appreciation for International Workers Day, which is May Day, May 1st, right? So for example, our reproductive justice campaign is sending a massive text message, giving people the opt-in opportunity to uh, win I think it's like $150 Kroger gift card to go grocery shopping, right, for their family, right? So creating those kind of opportunities and also inviting them to our big May Day appreciation where we'll have food trucks, swag giveaways, and like live music or a DJ. I don't know which one we could afford yet, right? So creating events where people just want to come and you have that captive audience, either giving them something that they need or some level of like free and safe entertainment. We did drive-in concerts, we've done drive-in movies. Um, and when we're there, we ask people like, hey, visit this website. You know, it's like five minutes of a two hour experience. People won't be that frustrated with you. Check your voter registration now. If you're not registered to vote, we have people in these parts of the parking lot that can help you out. Trying to do stuff like that. Whatever works for your population too, right? Because maybe you guys don't want to do a drive-in concert. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I have a, a, a quick question regarding, uh, obviously we're going to want to customize messages and also um, figure out what are the hot topics for a particular demographic. Is there uh, best practices and tools that we can use once we identify uh, folks that aren't voting? Sure, I'll have to see what kind of documents that we have, but the first thing I'll say is you need someone from that community to at least influence and approve the messages that you're sending to that community, right? So when we work with people that have returned home from prison, I have never been to prison, doesn't matter, matter how many people I know or have worked with that have, I don't know. So I need to run this by our people either on staff or in community that know this group of people. I think that's the most important thing is having someone from the community that you're talking to and understanding they're not the spokesperson, right? Like I can't tell you what all black people want, right? I can tell you what the black people in my neighborhood are probably gonna respond to, but even I can't speak for everyone. So having a couple of people from that community really guide you that's also going to make you more believable because they're going to be the ones that introduce you to other potential base members, right? So mm -hmm. identifying that Latinx person that can take you to the places where Latinx people will register to vote and help you plan those events for that community. And doing that also really makes it actually genuine, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the first thing that you need when when you're trying to organize base, they got to trust you. Um, but I will try and see if I have any best practices document from either us or one of our one of our partners, excuse me, that can help just kind of lay that out for you. Great. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? We have time for one or two more questions. Um, I have yeah. a I have a question. Do you um, thank you, first of all, thank you so much. But do you have any paid employees who help put all of this together or is it all done by volunteers every bit of it great question no we definitely have paid volunteer i mean paid staff um we don't have a whole lot of paid staff all the time um one of the things that we like a lot of places struggle with is funding in the down times like right now um so we hired a few hundred canvassers during last year and historically, and we don't, we still have a 
several dozen, but we don't have 300 anymore, right? Um, but we do have paid people for our leadership roles, um, all the way down to our organizing roles. Some campaigns, we have more funding for canvassers uh, than others, but we have your kind of foundational right staff, and then we have specific organizers that work to find more volunteers and honestly to find more funding so that we can hire more people because we all probably know the thing with volunteers is they are great, but when they have to go, they have to go and you have to be grateful for whatever it is that someone was able to give you because that's what they were able to give you. So. Um, it's best to find money to hire for the things that you really, really need to, to get done. And that's way easier said than done. I, I wanna make sure that I know that I'm saying that like it's easy and it's not. And can you talk about the extent that um, people are dropped from the voting rolls and, and how do you research that? <clears throat> Sure. Um, so in our database, we are able to get the information from the Secretary of State's office, um, and we can just run a search in our VAN database. Um, I don't know what it would be called here, but if not VAN, I'm sure it's something similar uh, because it's powered by the... Okay, cool. Um, so you can run a search uh, with one of the discriminatory things being purged. Um, and that's that's the first place that we find them. But also because that information is going to be dated at least by a few months, if not even sometimes up to a year, depending on how up to date the county roles are at times. Um, and the Secretary of State's office is holding them accountable. Um, when we have those events where we're able to get people to confirm their voter status, that's another way to catch people in real time. Um, because otherwise, what happens is people realize it the day that they were voting uh, and they went to vote in person or something to that effect. Um, so it, it can be challenging, uh, but first starting with the the list that just says purged from the voting rolls is the first way and then finding more people also older people are more likely to be purged um in georgia uh it may be the same in maryland if you guys experience that um and that's often just because of their access to go vote uh so they're more likely to miss an election or two um and if you're in Georgia and a Democrat and you haven't voted in a couple of years, then it's very likely, right? Um, so running those campaigns to just let people know that that's even a thing that they need to check has been a part of our strategy as well. So we've spent money on those social media ads and the mailers to just let people know that they need to check their voting purge. Uh, we did a whole campaign when they started doing that. Um, we had shirts that said that I survived the purge, um, that we kind of rewarded with people when they uh, checked their voting status. And if they weren't registered, right, they had that opportunity right there to get to get re-registered if they hadn't already shown up. Tony, you, you raised this and um, also Crystal, a piece of this too. Um, hi, I'm out of Worcester County, uh, but wanted to join your meeting today. Welcome. Uh, one being that uh, I think we under tap the resources that bring folks together who trust each other. And um, an example of that in churches of color, and I don't mean um, only black, I really mean Hispanic, Asian, et cetera, is that if you can tap that resource, starting with the pastor, because in communities of color, the pastor has the last word. And if it doesn't go by the pastor, it ain't going. <laughs> um, but for instance, in the summertime, the Hispanic churches in our area meet in the evening six o'clock in the evening because in the daytime they're working in hotels and restaurants and whatever. So it may mean after traditional hours. Um, I wanna share very briefly uh, what, what I believe might be some of the, uh, I'm not sure resistance is the word. Is everybody hearing music except me? 
don't hear anything. You don't hear anything, music? Carolyn, no. Wow, I hear loud music. Anyway, <laughs> um, I first came to Ocean City for a visit with a friend in 1973. And we're having a good time on the beach. She goes into the water and I'm still on the sand. And this woman comes up to me and, and literally um, says, give me a And I said, excuse me, what did you say? Anyway, I asked her a few times and what she had said is, can you do me next? So now I'm thinking, do people proposition here? <laughs> but it, what brought me here was the love of the beach. What I didn't know at the time is it had just been 1972 when the beaches were integrated. That up until that point, there was a certain part of a day once a week that people of color were allowed to be on the street, let alone taking uh, advantage of the resources. Second thing I want to say is, and that's 73, um, 2003, um, I was a senior pastor of a local church and one of our parishioners, a teenager, was killed. Um, unfortunately, killed by um, a policeman who was going too fast um, and his brother was maimed and had prosthesis and whatever. Anyway, long story short, you were talking about resource availability, and um, I really, really pushed that some streets in, in our area, it would be Flower Street and Bay Street, didn't have sidewalks and had rough, um, a rough passage for kids to get to school. Um, finally, the outcome was that a light was put up speed zones were put up and the sidewalks were installed in the forward side of town. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Tony, Welcome. we want you to uh, get back to your vacation. Um, and we don't want to take up any more of your time, but I think I speak for everyone saying just how appreciative we are and how helpful um, having you. And I hope we can tap into you in the future. Yeah, absolutely. I will put my email address down here if anyone thinks of any questions um, and you know wants to know anything, please feel free. Um, I really, really enjoyed being here with you guys today. And like I said, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Okay, one, one final so request. Much. We wanna see your t-shirt. Oh yes, here we go. Your vote influences everything. Love it, love it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone, have Enjoy a great the rest night. Of your time, bye-bye.